CSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. When you work on a program like Motoring 95, more often than not, you're asked what your favorite car is. Well, that's not an easy task, but if I did have a top 10 list, this Porsche 911 Carrera 2 would be the top of my list. This is the new 95 Porsche 11, and you know, when I first saw my first Porsche many, many years ago, it was love at first sight. And unlike some of the other Porsche models, Porsches remain true to the design of the 911. More on this car later on, but first we're going to begin this week's program with a story about another love affair. Spring Hill, Tennessee, home of the Saturn Car Company, rolled out the red carpet to give Saturn owners an inside look at the Saturn plant and the opportunity to celebrate being an owner. Originally, we received letters from customers saying that uh, they send us gifts and say I'd like to come down and, and see where my car was built. This was several years ago. And we started getting more and more letters and then uh, the marketing team decided to look at what could we do and to bring everyone down. And uh, I visited with the team to the, at the Harley Davidson homecoming last year, year before last, and uh, looked at some of the logistics of that. And we decided that it would be a good thing to do to invite the cars down and have them bring their drivers. Where are you from? What brought you down? I'm here from Hollywood, Florida, and seeing a manufacturing facility bringing me here. My name's Bruce. Hello, everybody. Right. Um, just love my Saturn. I got an SL1 and 91. I think I was one of the first in South Florida, a manufacturing engineer, and that's why I bought it. I don't want to miss my tour bus, so <laughs> thank you. I remember back the old days when, I, when my brother was in high school and he had an MG and they had the rallies, you know, and they used to do the tours through the mountains and have the stops and everybody would get together and party and I thought, well, that kind of sounds like that might be what this is all about. So we thought we'd come down here and meet some people and have a good time. It's been great. All of you people will go on in about 50 minutes. I mean, 20 minutes. I got a fireball for you guys coming up, all right? I'm from Barrie, Ontario, and uh, so far I think it's well organized. It's really a lot of fun and uh, very interesting. A lot of aspects of the car that I got a chance to see that as a, an owner I wouldn't have otherwise. When people feel that, that they are working in their best interest in their company, and that's truly how our people feel, the results, the, the leveraging one to the other, the individual talents, you know, as a result of the team effort is absolutely outstanding. And it's nothing more than giving people the skills to enhance their God-given talents and then letting them make business decisions. And in doing that, you just stand out of the way. What we have here is a hybrid electric vehicle. Uh, we have an internal combustion engine and an electric motor in this vehicle. Uh, the whole philosophy is that we use a small engine that runs on methanol that is underpowered for the car and then add power to it with an electric motor when needed. That drains power from the battery pack, which is then replenished once you reach a cruising speed once again. So you never plug this vehicle into the wall. We get the equivalent of 60 miles per gallon uh, gasoline fuel economy. We also have cut the emissions of the standard Saturn in half with this vehicle. Is this for anything we want on the Saturn? Yeah, that's what we want. The biggest change for new 1995 is the dual airbags. The whole instrument panel and console have been changed. This dual airbag system combined with a three-point automatic, with a manual safety belt instead of an automatic safety belt is a big improvement over the car. And we also have the energy absorbing console and instrument panel to help your knees in an impact situation. Saturn's very strong in Canada right now. Last month's sales we exceeded a year ago by 39%. Uh, which is a great, great month for us, and we're very happy with that. We've sold almost 9,000 cars in Canada for the model year to date, and uh, that's exceeding our expectations. Our sales for the year are up about 17%. Resale is very important. Residuals are very important. We have not gone to the fleet market for extra volume like a lot of other manufacturers do, 
And if Saturn continues to keep its strength in sales, it will continue to hold that high resale value that it has in Canada, just like it has here in the United States. Driving down the highway, singing honeymoon and lovers kiss and drive a Saturn tonight. There's I have to remember that like Canada got Saturn a year after it started in the United States, so we're, we're playing catch up a little bit, but our, our retailers have the philosophy, have the understanding that the, the customer needs and, and wants to exceed those needs at all, at all costs. So I, I would say to you that uh, I think in a matter of time we'll catch the United States and we'll have the same religion, if you want to call it, that uh, you see prevalent here today. Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at Ford's second generation Explorer. Now, where better to put a vehicle like this through its paces than a 600,000 acre ranch in New Mexico? Well, that's where we are, and the fun has already begun. The new Explorer is offered in both two and four door models and in both two and four wheel drive. The addition of the two-door Expedition model is sure to attract interest from the off-road crowd. The restyle of the new vehicle is limited to new front fenders, a lower hood line, a set of new rear lamps, plus a total revamp of the interior. Now, while that may not sound like much, it gives the Explorer a more contemporary look and feel. Beneath the hood is a 4-litre V6 that has been modified to improve both fuel economy and reduce emissions. The modifications come in the form of a new composite intake manifold and both the cylinder heads and pistons now use fast burn technology. Power is rated at 160 horse and 225 pounds feet of torque. Matched with this engine are either a 5 speed manual or a new electronically controlled 4 speed automatic. The engine complements either equally well. Perhaps the single biggest improvement on this Explorer is found right here at the front end. Gone are those Mickey Mouse twin traction beam they used to use on the old 4x4s. In place of them, they've got a short, long arm, double wishbone design front suspension. Combine that with the new rack and pinion steering, and you have a vehicle that is infinitely more capable. On the highway, it tracks a lot truer, and off-road, you get a lot better feedback when you're in this sort of territory. Not only does this double wishbone suspension minimize camber change, it has allowed Ford to fit a set of Mammoth 25570 all-terrain tires on the Expedition model. Combine these things with Ford's new control track four-wheel drive system and off-roading becomes a real treat. The control track system offers three different positions, two-wheel drive, automatic four-wheel drive and four-wheel drive low. At the heart of the system is an electronically controlled multi-plate clutch. In the automatic four-wheel drive mode, the majority of the engine's power is delivered to the rear wheels. If the system detects slippage, it automatically begins to supply more power to the front axle until it reaches a 50-50 split. Once traction is regained, the system reverses this procedure. The result is a highly drivable system that displays little of the usual driveline wind-up you get with other part-time systems. Select four-wheel drive low and the center clutch locks to give you maximum traction. During our off-road session, this aspect of the new transfer case worked to perfection. When it comes to safety, the Explorer again hits the mark. As well as standard dual airbags, adjustable upper seatbelt anchors and child-proof rear door locks, the Explorer features standard anti-lock brakes complete with discs at all four corners. During the brake tests, I required just 121 feet to stop from 80K. Now, given the loose surface, these stops are better than average. Inside, the angular approach of old has gone in favor of a new rounded theme. The instruments are analog and complete. The heater and air conditioning controls are of the rotary variety and sit in the right place, and that is below the radio. On the subject of the radio, Ford get extra points for returning at long last, I might add, to a proper knob for volume. 
Elsewhere, the power windows, locks and mirrors are located in the door, making them easy to access. The same applies to the steering wheel mounted cruise control functions. Up front, the sport bucket seating provides ample comfort. The same cannot be said of the rear seat. It is under padded and lacks both thigh and back support. On a long trip, it becomes decidedly uncomfortable. That said, it is a 60-40 split folding design which maximizes versatility as well as offering a nice generous wide flat floor pan. The bonus being that there is no requirement to remove the headrest to fold them down. The final touch comes with the addition of a power lock button located on the rear quarter. During the introduction of this vehicle, Ford suggested they'd made a quantum leap in terms of performance. Have they? For my money, they have. The new control track four-wheel drive system is infinitely better than the one it replaces, as is the redesigned front suspension. In a nutshell, there's a world of difference. It's time to introduce you to our lone long-term tester, the 1995 Saab 900S. We picked this model because of its perceived long-term reliability. Last year, when we awarded it our family car of the year, many people raised this specific issue. Well, what better way to find out than first-hand? Along with reliability, we'll also take a close look at the cost of operation, another area that has been a source of anxiety for some owners in the past. The 1995 Porsche 911 comes with the retractable spoiler. This spoiler engages at 80 kilometers an hour and helps keep that back end down on the pavement. And speaking of the back end, which is my favorite part of this car, some new rear suspension has really helped things when you're doing some, shall we say, enthusiastic cornering procedures. Now under the hood, we've got the 3.6 liter horizontally opposed flat six boxer engine, and this baby produces just over 272 horses. Now the Porsche, in fact, all the Porsches, even the new ones, are bucking a really popular trend. And I agree with them, and we'll tell you more about that later on. But first, let's join Bill Gardner in the Motoring 95 Garage. In the late 70s and early 80s, as manufacturers not only trimmed the overall size of their vehicles, they started substituting a lot of lighter weight materials in critical places like the engine. Now, cast iron used to be the material of choice for most engines, but aluminum s slowly started to replace it in many engine castings, and that created a certain amount of service problems for us down the road, and that's what we want to talk about this week. We've got a couple of, of examples here on the bench. This is an intake manifold from a late 70s Chevrolet 350 V8. It's made of cast iron, and it was an extremely stout component that would never fail, but it was extremely heavy. It was all you could do to pick that thing up with two hands. And the time it took you to place it properly on the engine was all you could do to support that weight. Now, we've got an aluminum aftermarket replacement manifold that would also fit that 350 Chevrolet V8. And you can see I can pick it up with one hand and hold it there just about forever without fatigue. It's less than half the weight of that cast iron component. But we saved a lot of weight. We also created some problems. And the typical thing that happened with these engines the problem that was created was corrosion. Now I've got an intake manifold gasket here from another GM engine. This one happens to be an Oldsmobile uh, 5 liter or 307 V8 engine. They used a sheet steel gasket between the intake manifold and the cast iron cylinder head on that engine. Now in the, in the middle 80s Oldsmobile switched the intake manifold uh, material to aluminum and as a result a lot of corrosion took place in those engines and we got jobs in like this one that you see right here, a manifold gasket that had failed. The corrosion that takes place in these engines with dissimilar casting materials like aluminum and cast iron can be pretty severe. Now up in this corner of the manifold you can see that the gasket is eaten away to roughly half the width and thickness that it should have been. And tracking right down from that area is, is a, a trail of sludge and that's evidence that some engine coolant had leaked in and mixed with the crankcase oil which is a slow death for any engine. Now over in this corner of the same manifold gasket, you can see that there's actually a piece of the sheet steel gasket that's eaten away and, it, and the pressure in the cooling system blew it away and we had a major leak in this corner to the external area of the engine and, and that's actually what the driver of the vehicle noticed was the coolant trickling on the ground. Now the coolant manufacturers would have you believe that if you flush the cooling system and replace the coolant on a regular basis, you'll totally avoid this problem. You might on some cars, but in certain designs, 
this kind of a failure is totally inevitable as the car ages. So keep an eye for oil contamination. Make sure that you change the engine oil and the coolant at the prescribed intervals. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 95. The go-karts rolled into Barrie, Ontario this past summer, bringing all other traffic to a standstill. But nobody was complaining, as Barrie welcomed its first ever go-kart Grand Prix. Over 400 carts from across North America were there for what organizers hope will become an annual event. These are all go-karts that are made for racing. They're not what you would see at a rental uh, track. These are high-bred, purebred racing machines and basically they have they have no springs, they have no shock absorbers, so the driver acts as a, as a shock absorber if you wish and the chassis is very flexible so that it gives them the same really the same handling that you would get in a, a major auto car. They have to do everything that an auto racer has to do or the mechanics do. They have to play with tire pressures, have to play with their camber, their toe in, their toe out. Uh, it's all based on the guy who gets here early and figures it all out. That's the one who's going to win a race. One of our sponsors, I think, saw the magnitude or the potential magnitude for an event of this nature. As you know, auto races in the streets are nothing new, but go-kart racing at this magnitude is uh, relatively new. I know there's another major event in Elkhart, Indiana, and the other one is in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So I guess we're one of three street races in North America. What it does, especially in the four-stroke, it teaches them to be a very smooth driver. Even though they don't uh, reach the high speeds, but they do go 50 or 60 miles an hour, um, because in a four cycle, if you get off the line, if you scrub it, you lose power, and then you're out of the race or way, way behind. So that's sort of the progression. And then they'll move to the two cycle machines, which are very quick. And then from there, they can move right into cars. And many of today's top drivers did just that, including Jacques Villeneuve, Scott Goodyear, and Paul Tracy. In fact, Tracy was a surprise visitor and thrilled the crowd with a few laps. 14-year-old Tim Morphy hopes to follow Tracy's example. A native of St. Thomas, Ontario, Tim is already a five-time Canadian national champion. Tim was the first Canadian since Paul Tracy to drive for a factory team when he competed in Italy at the World Junior Championships for an Italian team. I was five years old in St. Thomas. We had uh, some friends that raced. My dad, my dad asked me if I wanted to race because I like I liked watching it, and so he got me a used cart and we started on the dirt race uh, for about a year and a half. Then we went to asphalt racing and we've stayed there since then. I'm only 14 right now, so I gotta wait till I'm 16 to move up to senior. And I'll, I'd like to race uh, Formula A, or shifter cart, 125. And uh, I would like to go to the Senior World Championships too if I could. So that's probably a goal for after the Junior World Championships. A lot of carts out there, and you just gotta keep your eyes open and watch what's going on. It's really, really fast track here, really fast, so it'll be a lot of fun. Well, we have something like 400 competitors. I think that's a record for a karting event in Canada. Events of this nature are good for the city of Barrie, so this is the first one, and we'll see what happens from here. Our Midas tip of the week concerns starter motors. Most of today's vehicles start pretty willingly, but I'm sure at one time or another you've all experienced a situation that required extended cranking. Maybe your ignition system was wet, car could have been flooded, or maybe you just ran it out of fuel and it was slow picking up the new fuel you put in the tank. In any case, underneath your engine there's an electric motor like this that's only intended for part-time duty. 10 to 15 seconds of cranking is the most this motor should endure. If the car hasn't started in that length of time, you need to rest this motor. Pause for one or two minutes, allowing it to cool down. These things get real hot in a real hurry. 
If you do that and you're careful about those starting attempts, there's a good chance you may never have to replace this starter motor. They're pretty expensive. That's your Midas tip of the week. What's it gonna take to get you into one of these fine, shiny, lovely new cars? Come on down to Kenzie's Corner. That's coming up next. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. This might look like the biggest new car lot in the world. Well, it's, it's almost that good. Every year, Canada's automotive journalists come to Shannonville Motorsport Park in southern Ontario, and the car manufacturers bring all their latest and greatest cars for us to evaluate. And you know, we find out some interesting things. During performance testing, for example, we found that one car with anti-lock brakes stopped 10 meters quicker from 100 kilometers an hour than the same car without ABS. Now, did you think that all ABS did for you was make it easier to control? Well, so did we, but it actually stopped quicker in this particular case. Another thing we found that was interesting was to compare cars side by side. We have here a group of family cars, all priced around the $20,000 mark. We got a chance to drive each of them on the same roads, on the same day, under the same conditions. And it was interesting the kind of differences we found. Some cars were large, spacious, comfortable, lots of interesting comfort and convenience features. Other cars were smaller, more nimble, had better handling, better fuel economy, but they all cost about the same amount of money. Now, what does this mean to you as a consumer? Well, two things. First of all, when you go shopping for a car, you have to know exactly what it is you need and what you want. Don't get confused by other issues that may arise during your buying process. Secondly, when you're comparing cars, try to do it on an apples-to-apples basis as much as you can. Drive the cars at the same time of day over the same kind of roads and make your comparison tests in as short a period of time as you can so you can remember one thing to the next. Now, what was my favorite car in this? Well, I think you better wait for the Motoring 95 Car of the Year show coming up soon. I'm Jim Kenzie. I mentioned earlier that Porsche is continuing to buck a pretty popular trend and that trend is for manufacturers to try and produce the best cup holder. I mean, even Saab has introduced them into their 95 lineup. Well, no matter how much I enjoy a good cup of coffee, I'm happy to report that you will not find a cup holder in a Porsche. I mean, if you're going to enjoy this speed demon to the fullest, you got to have both hands on the wheel all the time. In fact, there's only one real problem in driving a Porsche. You might have a hard time wiping the grin off your face. Now, I'm sorry if I sound like a car salesman this week, but we all have one car we're passionate about, and for yours truly, it just happens to be this one. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 95 is proud to introduce the first in a series of comprehensive test drive videos with an exclusive comparison of the seven most popular minivans in North America. Graham Fletcher evaluates performance, versatility and safety. Bill Gardner examines each van top to bottom, front to back and under the hood. Jim Kenzie covers showroom savvy, the demonstrator, buying or leasing, options and much more. We'll also compare fuel economy, safety features, warranties, replacing parts and recall history. For your copy of this exclusive comparison video, send check or money order to Motoring 95, P.O. Box 65213, Toronto, Ontario, M4K3Z2, or call 1-800-340-7607. 416 and 905 area codes call 416-462-1504. TSN's Motoring 95 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension and steering service, trust your car to Midas.